reflection. Only your skills die with your body. Mine will survive long after I'm gone. Okay, hi guys, and welcome to the show. And today we are finally getting uh, to review the No Time to Die official Amiga Seamaster 300. This is the Bond watch. Moya Jewelers have once again stepped in to save the day. I am a personal customer. I've bought and sold from them. They are not only very generous in lending this watch in, but uh, one of the most professional authorized dealers for Amiga and a whole host of other illustrious brands. Um, too many to, to mention. Um, so I highly do recommend them. As you can imagine, I am really chuffed to bits to finally get my greedy horological mitts uh, onto this uh, piece here. Now, uh, I, I'll do a quick wristwatch check. As we are in Seamaster territory, I'm wearing my vintage, uh, I think it's 1958 or seven, I can't quite remember. I recently picked this up for an absolute bargain price. Still adore it, um, the heyday of Amiga. And I, I'm just extremely pleased to have found one with an unpainted, untouched dial, as you can see by the lettering of the Seamaster, for example. Uh, anybody worth their salt can instantly see that it is um, untouched. So I'm very, very happy about that. Having an, a, a Seamaster in my personal collection again really does feel, um, well, I've owned so many, does, it, it just feels great. Now, before we get into the history of the Seamaster, a little bit of context about the Seamaster range, uh, because we have seen several big releases in the last few years, especially as we Bond fans eagerly await the much delayed latest installment uh, with No Time to Die. In the last Bond movie, Spectre, in 2015, uh, 007 wore two Amigas, in fact. A vintage-inspired Seamaster 300, the Spectre limited edition with the rare lollipop seconds hand on a black and gray nato which very much set a trend for the subsequent few years and the second watch was the far more dressy aquaterra 150 uh, meter uh, with that striking blue dial during the production of no time to die in the last few years daniel craig has then surfaced to promote a newly redesigned and upgraded seamaster 300 professional which I naturally immediately reviewed. It sparked off much speculation that Bond would be returning to the 300 meter rather than just the 300. As 2019 drew to an end, the inevitable announcement came, sparking a viral post on the Urban Gentry Instagram. An incredible amount of hype then followed, uh, especially as everyone was really anticipating the movie and then with the unfortunate delay due to world events uh, amiga have since released the numbered edition which came in platinum steel and gold versions this was originally planned to coincide with the movie premiere amiga obviously went ahead but what makes today's watch particularly unique is two things firstly uh, this is not uh, in limited quantity and secondly it was actually built with military needs in mind and the final design was influenced by Daniel Craig's own experience as James Bond, which I think is very, very unique. Amiga is certainly no stranger on the channel and I have shared its long legacy many times. Founded in 1848, the Swiss luxury watchmaker is without a doubt one of the most illustrious and well-known brands of all time. When we think Amiga, we automatically think of Speedmasters, the choice of NASA, and the first watch on the moon in 1969, uh, among many other achievements of course. But uh, the Seamaster line is even more prestigious in some ways. It's the brand's uh, longest or continuously running line of watches and perfectly demonstrates the brand's evolution from traditional high precision mechanical watchmaker to a luxury cultural icon. But before becoming the choice of James Bond in 1995 with Pierce Brosnan, Omega and the British military uh, have been um, inextricably linked ever since the Royal Flying Corps used them in 1917 as their official timekeepers for their combat units as did the US American Army, in fact, in 1918. But what is more astonishing and often overlooked when it comes to Amiga is how they were already conquering the depths of the ocean decades before the first true luxury dive watches by Blancpain and subsequently Rolex. 
All the way back in 1932, Amiga debuted its Marine Watch, which was worn by Yves Le Brayer, who many consider to be the father of modern diving. He was a French naval officer and inventor of the modern scuba mask and tank. First launched in 1948 to commemorate the 100-year anniversary of uh, Amiga, the Seamaster line was loosely based upon designs made for the British Royal Navy towards the end of World War II. In fact, a more refined calibre of the legendary Manuelwind 30T2 in my Amiga Spitfire pilot watch can be found in many of the early Seamasters, going by a different name of course. By the end of the war, Amiga had solidified its reputation for accuracy and reliability, and so much so that Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery personally visited the factory in Switzerland after the war. The first Amiga Seamaster was a rather dressy looking affair, and modelled after the waterproof wristwatches made specifically and worn by the British military during the war. What distinguished the Seamaster from its diving watch predecessor was the O-ring gasket, which improved its water resistance. Amiga turned to submarines used during the conflict for inspiration and included a resilient rubber gasket in the Seamaster's final design. This new case remained intact at depths up to 60 meters and temperature ranges between minus 40 to 50 degrees Celsius. Their engineers were so confident of the Seamaster's durability they attached one to the outside of an aircraft and flew it over the North Pole in 1956. By the end of the 1950s, many brands, like those previously mentioned, and countless others for that matter, had started producing dive watches. Spurred on by the rise in recreational diving, it was time Amiga got a piece of the action too. So, in 1957, this was perhaps one of Amiga's influential years, the Seamaster 300 was born in their most iconic trio, alongside the Speedy and of course the Railmaster. The Seamaster 300 would go on to be issued once again to the British Ministry of Defence and worn by famed oceanographer Jacques Cousteau's team during their 1963 Conshelf 2 experiments in the Red Sea. With the success of the Seamaster, the range then expanded rapidly over the following decades with a whole host of record-breaking and innovative dive watches throughout the 1960s and 70s. Like the helium-proof Plo Prof, designed to meet the needs of ultra-deep saturation diving, and a direct response to Rolex developing the first automatic helium escape valve. So when it came to succeed the iconic Seamaster of the 1990s, the Seamaster Planet Ocean was introduced in 2005 as a large diving watch to ensure water resistance down to 2,000 feet or 600 meters. This evolution then culminated in 2011 with models like the one we're looking at today, uh, which featured a master chronometer rated movement. As always, let's start with dimensions first. We got a diameter of 42 millimeters with the bezel being flush with the case. The height is just a smidgen over 12 millimeters. Lug to lug we're looking at 48 millimeters and a lug width of 20 millimeters. So a very contemporary scale, uh, quite large, but generally with the exception of its um, thickness, pretty much the same as your regular Seamaster. Now the material, as you've noticed by this darker color, is entirely grade two titanium, which makes it uh, particularly strong and lighter. And just to give you an idea, if we pop the scales down there, it's nicely zeroed, let's have a look. It's about 73 grams. Now this is remarkably light. So in fact, almost half the weight of your average steel Seamaster in the equivalent size. We have a gently, very gently domed uh, sapphire glass uh, sitting smoothly above the bezel, very much giving it a, a vintage style distortions as you turn it. On the inside of the glass, we have anti-reflective treatment, as you can see from that purplish hue. This lightness and newer, slimmer profile gives the watch an incredible amount of comfort. I, I have to agree, I was expecting it to be too big, but um, you hardly notice when you're wearing it. And in a military context where every single gram counts, uh, this is where it succeeds masterfully. The finishing is also remarkably different. There is no high polished surfaces. Uh, the duller ash colored gray uh, that is in a brushed and bead blasted finish, if, as you see on the back there, very low key compared 
to your typical um, shiny high polished surfaces this is very deliberate and reminds me of the parkerized finish of my Vietnam era mil spec Benrus field watch uh, if you remember that piece those were designed specifically so it would not reflect light and reveal your position uh, accidentally to the enemy this is perfect for a commando or in the case of commander bond um, you know it's a, it's a really nice stealthy look and i think it actually does work to, to a degree and we'll discuss the color scheme in a moment but it does work really well in particular with the matte finish of the bezel and of course that tropical textured dark gray dial kind of off black really the bezel insert and the dial are actually the same material they're made out of aluminium uh, but what they've done and i really do appreciate this is they've given it a full loomed up bezel so now with full illumination we have super lumen over not just on the hands the applied indices uh, and the loom pip at 12 but all the way around and it is absolutely breathtaking you get astounding uh, orientation very easy to differentiate between the markers because of these clearly defined bold shapes as you see so you always know where 12 o'clock is but with the double markers obviously uh, so in low light legibility it's just perfect now once again uh, amiga have gone to the trouble of cleverly having different colors for the loom of the minute hand and the pip in the triangle uh, of the bezel the most crucial hand to a diver or soldier using it for operations in conjunction with the dive time bezel of course they are in a neon green as opposed to the arctic blue glow of everything else the bezel is unidirectional 120 click it is very hard to um, turn with gloves on which is surprising as in the film you see bond with the those German tactical gloves which I actually have a pair of those without gloves it's very very easy but again it's the it's the um, the old Achilles heel of the scalloped bezel admittedly it does feel a little bit plasticky to the to the click uh, but this is due to the lighter titanium however its accuracy and actual um, lining up is, is is perfect it's just that I'm not really used to titanium um, so at first it, you might <laughs> You, you kind of need to get used to it, I guess. As with all post Seamasters of the Brosnan era, we have the instantly recognizable helium escape valve at the 10 o'clock, and then your conventional uh, screw down crown, which is guarded with those lovely rounded um, crown guards at the 3 o'clock. And they are both individually signed, periodic table HE and the Amiga Greek letter brand logo. Unlike most modern Seamasters, the Nyad lock uh, screwed case back is very, very flat indeed. It's a simple affair. No beasts of ancient Greek mythology here. The hippocampus has been sacrificed to go for a more British military inspired engraving. We have, of course, the, the broad arrow logo there and some numbers kind of mimicking the army issued mil spec uh, ancestors of many decades ago it's worthy to mention that this watch either comes on the nato strap this beautifully striped i love the khaki combination or you get a choice of the mesh it's a shame i didn't get to borrow the one with the mesh i was quite excited about that but whichever you choose they are all signed with little engravings uh, a lot of detail 007 there on one of the keepers for example the brand logo name and also matching titanium metal there and as nato straps go this feels very substantial and very luxurious a little bit ironic considering that a nato strap is meant to be very utilitarian and cheap to produce so and astonishingly there's about a grand difference in price if you decide to go with either the milanese mesh or uh, the nato strap as you see here inside we have the amiga automatic caliber 8806 as it doesn't have a display back i'll use uh, some footage from the planet ocean which has a similar movement almost indistinct in architecture just to give you an idea of what it looks like if you were to remove the case back this is a master chronometer certified metas tested it's completely in-house produced a true marvel of engineering and i'm really pleased about this because it's a return to competitive 
uh, cutting edge mechanical movements before the slightly dodgy 70s and the fallout from the quartz crisis. I mean, these movements have been the culminations of decades of improvement and, and uh, evolution. Uh, and not only do we have the coaxial escapement, which is the biggest change to one of the most significant horological advancements since the invention of the traditional lever escapement, but we also get a free sprung balance, silicon balance spring, bidirectional winding, stunningly beautiful rhodium plated finish with this Geneva waves in an arabesque pattern that really highlights the sense of motion. But for those who missed out my many videos on the subject, by utilizing radial friction instead of sliding friction at the impulse surfaces, the coaxial manages to significantly reduce friction and theoretically results in a longer service interval uh, and of course greater accuracy over a longer period of time. To further boost the efficiency and longevity of the movement, Amiga used the unusual uh, frequency of 25,200 vibrations an hour. It's also much more resistant to magnetic fields reaching 15,000 gores and has a healthy power reserve of 55 hours. And it goes without saying, it is of course hackable and you also get a delightfully smooth uh, and refined feeling manual wind. As we look at the case shape, it very much is quintessential Amiga with those twisted lugs that go all the way back to the Cadillac winged aesthetic of the 1950s. They're very elegant and also actually practical, I've got to say as well. There's a refreshing absence of date you'll notice on the dial, which gives the layout a, a very clean uh, and beautiful sense of balance and symmetry. Uh, but essentially in a utilitarian context, less complications, less chances of things going wrong in the field. The Rolex No Date Explorer worn by Fleming and the Bond Submariners are perfect examples of this kind of simpler form and function thinking. There's a lovely red tip to the second hand, complemented by the red italic signed Seamaster under the printed uh, brand logo. Of course, um, they've done away with the superfluous kind of extra decoration. And then those very instantly recognizable semi-skeletonized sword hand set. While it is a bit of a contentious choice for some, I absolutely love it. They do a good job of distinguishing the hours from minutes. So of course, for the hours, we have a circle. For the minutes, it's longer with a triangle in the end. But for the minute markings at the periphery of the dial, they've gone for that sectored look, which actually, if you look at it head on, you don't really notice it. But then if you look at it at an angle, you see the little sections. This was adopted with the more recent 300 meter Seamasters. And the gilt coloring of the printing works especially well with the grainy texture of that uh, tropicalized dial finish and it works well together. The arrow above the six o'clock mark is an interesting addition. It's called the broad arrow, which means, well, traditionally meant that it was issued to the British military. And unfortunately, the symbol is not protected, um, as we see here. Uh, and it has lately been used on watches that were never issued. The broad arrow symbol actually has heraldic roots and is a stylized or simplified representation of a metal arrowhead. Uh, it is a symbol used by the British government to mark uh, government property and it became particularly associated with the Board of Ordnance and later the War Department and Ministry of Defence. Inevitably it was exported to other parts of the British Empire but in terms of horology uh, you can see it in military marine chronometers and of course um, the watches during both world wars and so on. So let's discuss the positives. Well, this is the best of Amiga in terms of heritage, mechanical engineering and horological relevance. Uh, the quality of the production is, is unquestionably, impeccably well made. I could not find a single fault with it. Uh, on a technical level. Its cultural significance uh, with its direct association with the greatest movie franchise of all time uh, will undoubtedly immortalize it uh, as a classic and help to protect its value. 
But crucially, no matter how you feel about its aesthetics, it performs and it really does deliver. It's beyond COSC in accuracy, and thanks to the more rigorous standards of Amiga's Metas testing, it was barely a few seconds off. Outstanding and really rock solid. I mean, these are these are built like tanks, undoubtedly, from the inside out too. It's also refreshing that its slenderness uh, compared to the most Seamasters. Just to give it a bit of context, the very first Quartz Bond Seamaster from GoldenEye was a very dressy 11.5 millimeters. This is barely a millimeter more than that and it wears a lot smaller because it's thinner but at the same time a very bold and masculine scale that is extremely legible and divers are supposed to be bigger would i like a smaller size of course but we'll discuss that in just a moment uh, the general size though will please most wrists even on my six and a half inch wrist i didn't feel it was overpowering i love the mesh version it's already started a new trend um, just the same way the gray and black nato strap from spectre permeated into every facet of watch collecting and became very in vogue i can see the millionaires are going the same way it already has i know the second i saw the trailer for the first time uh, i i pulled out the old mesh and and put it on half of my divers you know instantly <laughs> but beyond that just like the nato strap it's very very comfortable as well and i think it's a smart move uh, by amiga especially as it evokes a connection to uh, or a link to the great divers in their rich legacy like the Plo prof my biggest positive has to be for this watch the absence of date it's a, not just a cool nod to fleming's own preferences but also the great uh, Amiga military watches. The anti-magnetic properties makes it very relevant and practical in today's digital world and even more so for 007. Surprisingly there were more negatives for me uh, with this watch than there were positives. So let's get to the elephant in the room uh, right off the bat shall we. Uh, the faux patina colouring is, well, way over the top in my opinion. It's kind of like a Dijon mustard yellow, um, and I think in low light even looks brown. Now, of course, you can get vintage watches that have discoloured to this extent, but I've never seen a watch from the 90s age this dramatically. It obviously is a Seamaster 300M and not a vintage piece that has tritium loom of course so it feels a little bit kind of forced um, a little jejune even or maybe anachronistic um, I think a more subtle approach would have been really more appropriate if you look at the 30 Atmos I co-designed for example the faux patina was more fitting there because it's a tribute to a famous dive watch uh, Squaler made for Blancpain in the 1960s and we used a much more restrained tone. And I just think that was a good balance because it was relevant to that time period, relevant to that style of the watch. At the end of the day, this is um, the Seamaster 300 meter professional didn't exist back in the day. So it's kind of a little bit strange. And the 21st century scale also um, it being 42 millimeters, kind of highlights that i mean with the exception of the plo prof which is a deep diving saturation diver watches were never this big if we think about it this darker tone does actually undermine its military efficiency a crisp modern white would actually be better suited rather than patina it's a little bit confused there i feel and due to the titanium strap compatibility is going to suffer a little bit if you're very particular about matching the hardware to the main case uh, as i am uh, you're going to probably find it a little bit difficult to to complement the watch again this is more of a minor annoyance and as we mentioned earlier the scalloped edge bezel is very difficult to grip with gloves on if you are going to be in the field i think a a coin edge or a cog style teeth like the planet ocean would have been far more efficient another slight negative is by sacrificing the steel and having this uh, uniformed finish you don't get that resplendent mirror finish there which uh, limits the watch i think sartorially this is a lot more tactical looking one thing i really did adore about the uh, some of the previous daniel craig amigas and in particular the brosnan 
Seamaster was uh, the compatibility, not just in whatever environment you were in, but no matter if you are uh, in a tux, uh, faux pasing it or dressed casual and going to the beach, it worked with everything. It had that ultimate dressy but toolish elegance, kind of like Bond himself, really. However, it is clear, as previously discussed in my last video, that Bond is no longer a one watch guy. Um, so perhaps when he needs to look a little bit more uh, refined, he simply sports his Aquaterra. Um, so while it looks great on the No Time to Die poster in his commander gear, in my opinion, it looks a little bit off when paired with his tux, as we have seen in some of the promotional material. Another possible negative is the use of the arrow. It might upset some of the purists. Personally, I don't mind it. In fact, I think Amiga have earned um, the right to, to use it as they did provide the majority of um, the watches from Switzerland during World War II. I wouldn't go so far as to say it's stolen honor, uh, for example. I mean, that would be like me wearing my ancestors Victoria Cross, um, so it's it's not that bad, but it is worth highlighting that this has never been actually officially issued. Now let's talk a little bit about um, value, shall we? I mean, priced at almost double the cost of your standard uh, Seamaster is certainly going to be for the most dedicated of collectors and Bond enthusiast only. In conclusion, it feels very appropriate that our British superhero spy and naval commander wears a watch with a coaxial escapement. Let's not forget the English horologist George Daniels who developed it with Amiga was considered by some to be one of the best in the world uh, in his field during his lifetime. Much in the same tradition as other English horologists for hundreds of years like John Harrison, Tompion, Marge, Kendall, Graham, Frodsham, and so on, who uh, assisted in making timepieces for the Royal Navy. I really do appreciate that they teamed up with the Bond franchise directly to make something uh, a little bit more special. Personally, if they had a mid-sized version without the crazy patina, I would be all over it. If anything, it makes me appreciate my own recent um, Seamaster acquisition but at the end of the day while i am not you know head over heels in love with this it definitely is an outstanding watch and will bring a ton of enjoyment to a serious bond fan and like the secret agent himself uh, it is extremely capable ultimately this watch is for uh, you know former sas types with easy smiles and expensive watches Okay, guys, I'm going to leave it there. Uh, don't forget to add your thoughts, queries, opinions, all the rest of it down below, especially what you think they got right. Uh, what would you like to change in this watch? What would you like to see in a Bond watch? Uh, all your feedback is very much appreciated. And I just love uh, engaging and, and um, seeing what you guys think of it. So do share that in the comments. Don't forget to like this video. Uh, there's also the uh, Urban Gentry store. There's the Facebook. There's the Instagram all the rest of it anyway you know the drill all right guys uh thank you so much for watching and i will catch you in the next one okay ciao